Welcome to week three of our four-week series on spiritual practices at home. Today's message will be exceedingly practical, with an emphasis on prayer, peace, and gratitude. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through the psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus. Hey, we're still home. And uh, all the kids that got their notice this week that school was canceled for the rest of the year shouted amen. And all the parents prayed for peace. <laughs> I'm with you and I'm thrilled to be with you in this series, especially I've so been enjoying uh, the last two weeks as Bruxy broke down really some beautiful theological scriptural truths from Colossians chapter three, and then challenged us uh, to live that out, to meditate, to pray, to study, just to mix those all together in this way of allowing God's spirit to use the scriptures to encourage us. And that's been an encouragement to my heart this week, Colossians 3. Well, a couple of things that stood out for me just to, to, to kick us off is Colossians 3, 1 and 2, just set your mind and set your heart on the things of Christ, on the kingdom of God, on the eternal realities, on things that matter. And I came across a study that said that 70% of our thoughts are based on the future or the past. We spend 70% of our thought life on the future or the past. And when we think about the future, especially in times that are uncertain like this, of course, what comes with thoughts of the future is a whole lot of anxiety. And when we look back at the past, almost always our thoughts are connected to regret almost always regret. So 70% of our thought life. Now, how do we fight that? If we want to fight feelings of regret or missing out, or we want to fight against anxiety in our own lives, what are the practices that we can do? And one of the main practices, this is even in scientific research, is, is meditation, is setting our minds on the present tense, which of course is, is Christ. Uh, I am Yahweh. The I am, the eternally present God is inviting us to set our minds and our hearts on him. But how? <laughs> now, if you're like me at all, you, you, maybe contemplation isn't that easy for you. Uh, it's not easy for me. It's been a long, long struggle. And I remember first starting this out, I was living in the downtown east side of Vancouver where kind of chaos r rages, you know, drug addiction and all sorts of injustices happening there. And I'm a justice advocate. So I was just like, let's get to work. Let's get to work. But it was right in that season, in that place that God told us and led us to establish a prayer room 24 seven nonstop prayer. And we prayed as a community for three and a half years without stopping. What we did is we just took shifts in this prayer room. And I remember the leaders, all the leaders said, that we would set the example. So we had three shifts a week, three hour, three shifts a week. I mean, it was a lot of prayer and a lot of prayer for someone like me who struggles with the practice of prayer. But really in those days, setting that time and place to pray forged in me, taught me, invited me to pray in new ways, to discover ways that I could pray, to set my mind and to set my heart on things above. And what was fascinating about that season in my life is just how much it made a difference in the way that I set about to do the work that God had called me to do in that community and how much it made a difference in the way that it webbed us together in unity as those of us who were uh, fighting together on that front. Now, I 
adamantly remember every single time I would go for a prayer shift, I would, I would walk over to the prayer room, which was a slum rooming house that we'd carved out one of those rooming houses as a, uh, one of those rooms as a prayer directive. And I remember walking there and just saying to myself, Oh brother, who has time for this? Like I do not have three hours to set aside to pray, you know, just grumbling the whole time and even spending the next, you know, sort of 20 minutes of my prayer shift, just grumbling out loud, basically to God and making lists of things that I needed to do. And, and just kind of like upset that I was having to spend this time praying. And then eventually as this pattern emerged, as I sensed the presence, as I settled that anxiety of the future, and as I, I, I let go of that regret from the past and just settled in and fixed my mind and heart on Jesus, something happened, something powerful, something transformational, the peace of God began to rule in my heart. And so I really would love to just share with you how we can rage against anxiety and regret and get focused on the presence. The problem is it's really hard for me to do that this way, you know, from one talking head to another. So I thought this would be so much easier if you could just come with me as I try to practice this out today. And uh, if you could come on a journey with me, if you could come on a prayer walk with me, if you could come into my house and meet my kids, if you could, if you could just come with me, I could, I could, I could share some of the things that I've learned that have helped me so much in my own life. Would you would you just want to do that? Just come with me on a journey of the virtual journey of setting my heart and mind on the things above. Why, why don't we do it? Why don't we just go ahead and do it? Let's not let technology limit us. Let's it inspire us as we do this together. Come on, let's go. Let's just get rid of this just a second here. Okay. When the scriptures say set your mind on things above, here's a helpful practice that I've determined. If you're like me at all, you're distracted. This is not, it's not easy to set your mind on things above because there's a lot of things going on in my mind. There's like a to-do list of things that are required. So here's what I usually do when I'm getting ready to pray, especially if I'm setting aside a fairly decent chunk of time, like any prayer day or half a day of prayer or even an hour or two of prayer. What I do to, per, to, to just get rid of that like constant pursuit of anxious thoughts in my head, mostly these are less kind of like dreary, horrible thoughts thoughts uh, and more just like, oh, laundry. I need to get lunch. I've got that kid's school app that I got to figure out how to do. And oh yeah, there's a book I've got to write. And oh yeah, a sermon that needs to be preached. And I forgot about that. And anyway, I make a list of things that are on my mind. And I write as many as them. I just take a couple minutes just to write as many of them that are on my mind, burdens that I'm carrying, things that I need to remember. And I just put them aside. I literally put them in an envelope. I seal that puppy up and I leave it. And I say, I'm leaving these. I'm putting them aside so that I'll get to them later. Don't worry. I'm going to come back to the things I got to do. But right now, that relentless list of things I've got to do, I'm putting aside. I'm giving them over to God. I'm leaving them. They're out of my control now. And now I can set my attention and my focus on God. It's helpful to set my mind on Christ when I've gotten rid of some of those distractions that have happened that are going on in my mind. And then I move on with my prayer day. Here's what I would normally do. I would normally come out and I would sit in this beautiful chair in my backyard. Uh, you can see it's been storming and raining today. So welcome to spring in Canada, everybody. But instead of that, maybe what I'll do is just uh, teach you a little thing that a friend taught me that was so helpful for entering a time of silence and solitude. Now, if you're like me at all, silence is not easy. As a matter of fact, it's one of the hardest things to do. And I need some help to get it done. And my friend taught me this little way of entering into silence uh, that is so uh, simple and easy. And it's based around this uh, little song, Be Still and Know That I Am God. It's also, of course, from the scriptures. And it's a melody that goes, be still and know that I am God. And she shared with me that once you get into a comfortable spot, maybe set a timer. Let's say you want to practice 10 minutes of silence and prayer. Set a timer for 10 minutes. We set aside our concerns, put the timer on, and then simply settle into your own body. Allow the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit into this space, and then begin to quiet with that song. So I would sing, 
Be still and know that I am God. And I just wait a couple seconds and then I'd sing again. Be still and know that I am. I'd wait a couple of seconds and then I'd sing another. Be still and know. And then I would sing again, be still. And one more time, be. And then I would enter into a time of silence and prayer. This is harder to do for some people than it is for others. Mom! Oh, and if you're a parent and you can hear that cry, there is a child crying Mom! for me. Mom? Yes, so if silence is hard for you, particularly in quarantine because you've got calls on your attention coming, then follow me. I've got some other ideas for prayer. Into the family for coloring prayer. All right, everybody, have a seat. Coloring prayer is a practice that anybody can do. My friend Stacy told me about it, and it is a remarkable way of harnessing your attention and your body, really, in, the, in an act of prayer. So uh, basically, uh, Judah has picked uh, a name of somebody to pray for happens to be Hannah and Judah is coloring Hannah's name while he's praying for Hannah. Yeah. How's it going? Good. Good. And so the way I'm praying, you can pray in any way you like as you're coloring. It can just be the thoughts through your mind of what you're going to ask God to do while you're coloring. Do you want to give us an example? Um, for example, let's say I have a friend who's sick. I, while I'm coloring, I pass through my mind what I'd want God to heal her and other things like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Good work. And who are you praying for, Moses? I'm praying for you. Oh, that's nice. Um, I just started right now. I'm still going to keep on coloring. Uh-huh. And then how does that, like, how does it work for you? You're coloring and you're praying at the same time? Yeah. Is that hard? A little bit, but I like it. It's yeah. fun. Excellent. Good. Yeah. We'll pray on. Carry on. Little coloring prayer, never heard anybody, and uh, is actually a really great way. Now, my friend Stacy, who I was in an accountability relationship, she introduced me to this concept of coloring prayer. And it's not super complicated, it's quite simple. And I, at first, I'm not really crafty, so I was sort of like, mm, that can't be that good of an idea. But because I was meeting her every single week, I realized that I should probably try it out because she gave me all the things. And so as I began to try it myself, I realized that it was such a helpful tool to just get my attention, to focus it, to harness my thoughts, to move my attention to an actual practice of prayer, coloring prayer, who knew? It's really helpful. This actually I take with me on the road. I have a little notebook and some coloring pencils and I bring them with me in my, uh, in my backpack. And as I even travel and go around the world, this is something that I pull out and do at a regular time. When I find it hard to focus my thoughts, I use coloring as a means to do that. That's not it though. We also have a thing called posture prayer. Those of you who've been tracking with infinitum life and all these notes, of course, I'll, I'll put them in the sermon notes so you can access them there. But um, the posture prayer is a way of using our body to actually pray and to posture our life in such a way that we are living and using our bodies as a way of prayer. I think Mo's going to come and help me do this. And um, and we do this together sometimes. And sometimes I definitely yeah. do it every morning. We usually at school when we were going to school. Yeah, before you went to school every day. Yeah. Basically, we put our hands up. Put our hands up. And we say, I surrender. I surrender. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. It belongs to you, God. It belongs to you, God. You can have all of me today. You can have all of me today. And then we hold our hands out. Hold our hands out. And we freely receive. We freely receive. In a posture of generosity. In a posture of generosity. And what do we need today? We need peace. We need love. We need hope. We need, we need righteousness. We need self. Yeah, we yeah, need, I need patience. I need a lot of patience today. 
What else do you need? Anything specific? We need joyfulness. We need joyfulness. Absolutely, we need joy. And then what do we do with everything that we've received? We give it to everybody. Yeah, we share it, right? Everything that we've been given, we're going to posture our lives to share it today. And then the final posture is a big fat hug. Woo! We keep our hands open and our arms open to say to like the prodigal son, right? Like the father and the prodigal son. And we say to the world, here we are. To the world. We love you. Here we are. <laughs> love you. Love yes. Us. Yeah, we do. And that's a posture prayer. Usually I set my Infinitum app to prompt me in the morning uh, with a daily thought. And then right after that daily thought, I use it as a trigger to move into the posture prayer. And if all else fails, if I forget to do that or I sleep through that prompt or whatever it is, then it's shower time. But come on, let's be honest, that's way too personal. So stay out of my shower. That's not the only way I pray. Those are a couple of disciplines and a couple of ways or means by which I can enter. I can enter into the discipline and spiritual practices of prayer and practicing the presence of God. But for me, an essential spiritual discipline is getting outside. It's the created order. It's being in and out in God's beautiful world. And so that looks fun. Want to come with me on that ride? All right. This involves leaving the house. And when it's not pouring rain, what I would normally do, a couple different strategies. One is I prayer walk around my own neighborhood and we walk down the street and I pray for each household. I pray peace and I pray blessing. As I begin to learn people's names, I pray for them by name or their families or some of my kids uh, have friends that go to school in this neighborhood. So we'll pray for them as we pass by their house and just pray that God's peace and blessing would be upon all of the neighbors and all of the house. And so it gets me outside, it gets me breathing fresh air, but it also is the practice of prayer, a spiritual discipline of praying for others and other people that maybe I don't even know. And this has been a beautiful way of practicing prayer in my every day. Uh, that's not it though. I love to get into creation, like into the woods, like into a trail, into a place that's beautiful uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. So you wanna keep coming with me? Do you wanna go all the way to my favorite trail near my house? I'd love for you to join me. Come on, let's do it. Hey, we're here at my favorite spot to go uh, running, praying, or walking, praying uh, in the great outdoors and even in the rain. Come on, let's do this. We're spiritually disciplined people. Let's get this, let's get this show on the road. You know, I was thinking about this in the Gospels, Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Jesus says, you know, don't worry about the things you can't control you know don't worry about life and anxieties and he says what you're gonna wear or even what you're gonna eat and he says like look at the lilies of the field like look at the birds of the air look at how god the creator sustains them and if god sustains them doesn't he even more sustain you care for you even more than he does for them i mean and I think there's just something about the practice of getting out and looking up in the wide open spaces, in the created order, in, in the way that God's designed the world, in the signs of spring, in the, the flowers that need water to nourish themselves, in the trees that are complicated and organized. Has anybody read The Silent Life of Trees? It's epic on how even trees begin to communicate with each other and their roots grow deep and just creation itself. The scripture says creation is like, is crying out. The, the trees of the field, the psalmist says, clapping their hands for the glory of God. I mean, creation is meant to be this sign and Jesus himself directing people look at what you see look at the signs around you look at the signs of spring here and the greenness and the freshness and the possibilities of what it means and all of this are ways that I pray just God you're present here you're you're bigger than me you know so part of getting out in creation I think is also a right sizing of our lives and 
if you think about it when you're inside in the space that you control and you organize and you design, you can kind of think like you're the designer, you're the creator, you're the organizer. But when you get out here, you're not in charge anymore. I didn't design this, like I, I can't design a tree. You know what I'm saying? Someone grew that tree, a creator bigger than me. And it right sizes me. It says, oh yeah, I'm part of a created order. I'm part of this system that God has created that is so beautiful and interconnected and designed. And the designer and the creator and the sustainer of all this is bigger than me, like so much. So it right sizes me. And then also it refreshes me, just literally oxygen in my breath, you know, like in my lungs, just looking up and looking out and getting right sized and being in creation with the creator, allowing nature itself to tell me a story, to speak to me about who God is and how loving and how awesome and how well he looks after the created order and how I'm part of that and I get to participate in that and I get to co-create in all of that space. That's just part of what happens. Sometimes when I do this, it looks like, you know, I've got, I've got earphones in and I've got worship music on. Sometimes I don't even have worship music on. Sometimes I just have regular everyday ordinary music on and I'm hearing cries. Uh, sometimes I just have my favorite podcast on. I'll put a couple of links in the sermon notes for some things that might be helpful to you, but uh, a lot of times I just don't have any earphones on and I'm just running through listening to the sounds of birds and the trees and looking for signs of what God's up to and even then attuning to my own breath and uh, the scriptures say in a couple songs you know let everything that has breath praise the Lord and I remind myself as we're breathing all of this in that I'm that person that has breath let me praise the Lord uh, let me do that and in this space it makes everything even more glorious and more beautiful. Okay, actually, before we go back to my house, I wanna stop by here on my running route. This is my favorite place to stop before I run home. And it's a Catholic church. It's beautiful, it's sacred. The inside is just, spacious and big it's got these massive mosaics and images of Jesus and uh, I often go there just for a couple minutes after I'm done running to contemplate the bigness of God to just spend a couple minutes silencing my soul and reflecting on who God is and come with me I'll, I'll show you usually just come in here to contemplate the goodness of God, take a couple of minutes. There's usually some sacred music playing and it's really chill and there's candles lit. And, and then, that, then it struck me, you know, even today that the, the church is closed, the building is closed. But we know that the church is not a building and all of us are kind of in this spot right now where we're frustrated and we're tired and we're exhausted of these like at home practices. I mean, we want to be where we want to be. We want to be in the gathering. We want to be inside the church, but the church is the buildings are not open. And so what does it mean to be the church and to contemplate the bigness and sacredness of God when the doors are shut? And this is helpful for me to reflect too this week, but one of the disciplines that helps me is to realize that the church, not only is it not a building, but it's also not just me. I'm just a part of the body of Christ, of the body of the church, that the church is made up of all of us together. And for me, what that means is part of the discipline of sacredness and contemplation, part of the discipline, the spiritual practice in my life that helps me cultivate a spiritually rich life is other people our sacred friends, our companions on the journey. What that looks like for me is every single week, I have a, a two other people that I connect with intentionally in what I call a hub and what the meeting house often calls a huddle. And we share vulnerably with each other. We share our journey. We ask each other for prayer. We, we, we tell the truth and, and, and we love each other. We encourage each other. We, we serve each other in, in so many ways and encourage each other along the way. And what that does is it widens my life. It broadens my perspective. It helps me to contemplate the bigness and sacredness and glory of God in the church, the real church, the living stones, the community, the hub, the huddle that I'm part of actually creates church that's so much more powerful than just a building where I contemplate. Uh, 
the hub, the community, is a building of people that grasp me into a living thing. And man, it helps me contemplate the glory of God like nothing else. So let's go back. So we have, all of us have a, oof, a bit of a conflict tension area when it comes to technology and prayer. And this is obviously because technology can drive us with the anxious presence of like always being at the other end of an email or an urgent need. Technology becomes a distraction like we've never even seen before. The pace of life, uh, people being able to distract us. And so that's a real thing. We need to pay attention to that. So some of us just need to get rid of it. Some of us need to put our phone away and make our list. And we need to get that silence or we need to get into coloring and just leave that alone. But there are also times where technology can help us to pray. And I found this true in my life as well. So I've already mentioned the Infinitum app. I use the daily prayer prompt. I use the prayer postures. I use the weekly hub questions and it prompts me to pray. Uh, a couple other apps that are really helpful to me. One is called Lecto 365. That's by 24-7 um, Prayer. And they uh, produce this daily devotional prayer time, which is really beautiful, scriptural reflection. And then just some, they lead you through some prayer postures that are really beautiful. And I often use that. They also have an app called Inner Room app. And I'll leave all the notes for these on the sermon uh, notes so that you can find these if they're helpful to you. But the Inner Room app is actually an intercessory prayer app. So you can load pictures of people that you want to pray for and keep track of. And my favorite way to use that app is they have have like a random prayer button and I love just it kind of feels like I don't know eternal gambling like spiritual like surprise and I just press the random prayer app and then boom somebody pops up that I really want to pray for and I can put my request right in there and then change it when the prayers are answered or when they change it it's actually been a fantastically beautiful way of praying and using technology to help me pray uh, the other app that I use quite a bit almost daily is the YouVersion Bible app not only do I read the Bible on there, but what I found really helpful in my own uh, sacred companion group or friend group is to pray through sections of the Bible together. So on that app, I can invite friends to journey with me through the scriptures and we can comment on the scriptures that we read that day. And there's a sense of accountability, but also there's a sense of togetherness. Even when we don't live near each other, there's a sense of togetherness in the scriptural reading that we're doing. So those are a few of the things, but uh, we even have more to talk about. So. Let's, uh, let's keep talking. Thanks for coming with me on the prayer journey. And, and where we're landing right here is in Colossians 3.15, where it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. How do we cultivate peace? Where does it come from? And what kind of peace is it? This specific use of the word peace in Colossians 15 is not the peace as in shalom peace, which is the fullness of all things, is the rightness of all things, sort of where this justice and fullness and wholeness come from. It really actually means calmness. It really actually means this like hum of everything's going to be okay, a non-anxious presence in the world. How do we get that. Well, that's why we went on the journey. As any way you can practice prayer, cultivating uh, attention, setting your mind and your heart on Jesus will produce peace in your life. It's the promise of God's spirit with us as we spend our attention and give our attention to him. There's a famous guy named Frank Lubbock who uh, made up a game called the, the Game of Minutes. He was a missionary to Muslims in a remote part of the Philippines, mostly working with people who were illiterate. And so he playfully came up with this idea that he was going to try to become aware of the presence of God for one second out of every minute. One second out of every minute, just as a way of cultivating attention to God. And listen, this is what he says. It's fascinating. Can I bring God back in my mind flow every few seconds so that God shall always be in my mind as an after image, shall always be one of the elements in every concept and precept? I choose to make the rest of my life an experiment in answering this question. 
Isn't that amazing? And here's what I wanted to say. You remember that list we made at the beginning of the journey? When we're done praying, when we're done sort of that set time and place that we've made an intentional time to cultivate an awareness of God, of course, that doesn't leave us. God is with us all the time and uh, continuing to pay attention to that is how peace reigns in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. But I take that list out because, like I said, it's, I still got to do these things. These things don't just magically disappear. We're not living in some sort of super uh, spiritual realm where all of those earthly things are beneath me. It's quite the opposite of that, actually. I'm living in the realm where I got to get some laundry done and some lunch made and kids' schoolwork finished. And I've got these to-do lists of things. But see, what happens with prayer is when we posture ourselves with attentiveness, when we set our minds and our hearts on Jesus, I don't no longer have to do these things by myself. I no longer have to do these things without the awareness and the felt reality that God is with me, not just in super spiritual things, but in everyday things. That there is no place that I am, even in the frustrations of trying to get my kids to understand how to multiply fractions, even in that spot, God is with me. Every single thing in my life becomes an opportunity for God to work. And that's what's so fascinating about uh, Colossians 3. Once we finish this passage, when you go you continue to read on. We're kind of scared of this. If you're a woman, you're scared of this verse in 18 because it says, wives, submit yourself to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And then it goes on. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. And then it goes on. Children, obey your parents and fathers. Do not embitter your children. Uh, and on and on this goes. And there's some passages in there where we're like, it bristles against our cultural norms. But Paul is not a friend of hierarchy. He's not trying to create some sort of hierarchical order. That's just a ridiculous understanding of this passage of scripture. What's true to understand about this scripture is what Paul is saying is that peace that you've cultivated, that attention that you've given to Christ, your mind and your heart on Christ Jesus, because you've done that, now the way you live can be seasoned. Every single thing you do can be filled with. Every single task you have can be an opportunity to practice this peace of Christ, to bring Jesus with you, to live right now as an eternity, as a, as a part, as a contribution to the kingdom of God, instead of just putting our time in here and then doing something spiritually that's separate from everything else we do. This is a beautiful way to live. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. As many members of one body were called to peace. Let's be thankful. Here's what I thought would be a fantastic exercise for this week as we keep practicing the still home, listening to the spirit and what he's saying to us in these times. I'd invite you to set the alarm on your phone for 3.15. 3.15 p.m., wherever you are, what I'd love to do as a community is as soon as that alarm goes off is for all of us to pray Colossians 3.15 together. Let's pray for the peace of God. Let's pray for the peace of God to guard our hearts, but also for the peace of God to, to come in each other, in the world in which we're living in right now, in governments, in businesses, in churches, as we figure out what's next on this COVID-19 journey. Would you join me? Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in our hearts and in our minds as we cultivate, even while we're still home, the practice of the presence of God through prayer. Hi, I'm Brexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.